One day I was in a small village and I saw this small and weird fruit and I asked an Afro-Colombian lady, hey, what's that fruit for? And she said, oh, that's the fruit we use to dye our hair and the, that, the fruit that indigenous people use for body painting and for temporary tattoos. And I was really curious about it. So, I think before we talk about Ecoflora um, and uh, what it is you do, I'm curious, I, I know so much of it is based on conservation of, of the rainforest, and wh why is that important to you? Well, it's not about conservation. Yeah. We failed to conserve, mm. so it's not about healing the planet. Yeah. It's time to start talking about restoration, mm. life regeneration, and uh, truly understanding that, yeah, we still have to conserve the fragments and the habitats that we still have, but mm. they're few. I was amazed to and, and learn recently that it, maybe by the year 2030 we'll be out of coral reefs, yeah. so the ocean's gonna be a pond of death, <coughs> uh, no living beings. So yeah, it's all about healing. Mm. Yeah, conservation's not fast enough, we've already done too much. Yeah, it's mm. been... And so where, where does um, your love, and this is almost a silly question, because but I just don't want to take it granted, where does your love for nature I mean, where does it come from? What, what are its roots? Family legacy. Hmm. My grandfather, he was a, a surgeon, so he, he was healing people, but at the same time, he was the founder of the Boy Scouts hmm. in Colombia. <laughs> <laughs> so we grew up uh, very close to nature, having these privilege of living in the most biodiverse country on earth yeah. was always like overwhelming and I felt so connected to nature, doing outdoors activities, getting to know our country, all its different corners and uh, ecosystems and the wonderful people living there, indigenous communities, Afro-Colombian communities, such a diverse place and crazy place at the yeah. same time. So, yeah. Yeah. You say crazy place, how so? Well, it's a place where the happiest people on earth exist. Yeah. And there's, you can search for the surveys uh, indicating that we are the happiest country on earth. <laughs> <laughs> Not Sweden? Yeah, what, do you want to come? <laughs> 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 only, only risk is wanting to stay, so. Mm. <laughs> And uh, coexisting with this madness that we've gone through the last five, six decades, and pretty much doing all the, the history of an, as a nation of uh, fighting each other, of inequalities, of war, uh, but still overcoming and being such a resilient society mm. to be able to be the happiest people on earth. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and there's so many things happening now. We're full of hope, of commitment, of uh, to make a, a different world uh, become true, a reality. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what, what gives you um, that level of hope when, how we started, um, you talked about 2030, the oceans potentially almost being lifeless. How, how do you still root in hope? Well, I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah. And I <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> <laughs> and they got to know all these amazing people that were selected. The first day I was here, I said, oh my God, am I really doing such good stuff? Are, as all my, my colleagues are here are. It's really amazing. And I, after being close to finish this program, uh, I'm truly re-energized, much more optimistic mm -hmm. about the amazing things and that there's true hope and the synergies that we can all have it's just a matter of connecting the dots mm. yeah. so so let's go back to ecoflora sure and the company itself if if you were you know, being brought up in this country surrounded by 
amazing biodiversity and spending time you know, in the wilderness. Yeah. But also you have these you know, socio-political and geopolitical and these you know, internal war that's going on. I mean, there's a lot of different issues you could align with as an entrepreneur. Yeah. You know, why, why this? Why EcoFlora? Well, uh, I am an engineer, civil engineer. And the more I learned about engineering, the more, the more I didn't like the vision of progress and development that has been, uh, that has prevailed. And uh, having the chance to evaluate and assess the impact of infrastructure projects to go through the Darien Gap and join the Americas, the missing 80 kilometers to pay, be paved to connect us. We don't need that. Mm. Why don't doing a ferry system as they have in the Scandinavia mm. instead of chopping it all down and destroying these very pristine and unique ecosystems? Mm. So I, th I felt I was in a wrong place and I started, uh, I changed and focused into sustainability and environmental uh, topics, uh, then entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And going back to my country, I wanted to put in practice my master's thesis, which I did on finding alternatives for sustainable living for people in the rainforest. Mm -hmm. So together with family, my family and friends, we started an, uh, an NGO which became a global movement that is transforming the way mining is conceived. And uh, it's, it was the first ever certification program to uh, validate and to, to certify the responsible mining practices of small communities doing subsistence mining. Mm -hmm. And we were able to develop something that was absolutely new to the markets, to the world, <coughs> of putting this label, receiving premium prices from jewelers and consumers out there that were curious about knowing where the gold, their gold, what they were wearing came from, ignoring before that it was full of blood, tears, war, prostitution, but now understanding that through that goal they were contributing through a program that became a, a mechanism to defend the territory of these small miners against illegal miners, true illegal miners that were excavators destroying the forest. And uh, it became big, it's now in 21 countries. But that was during the weekends and holidays. <laughs> Sorry, weekends and nights. <laughs> weekends and nights, and I had to do my living, of course, and yeah. I started doing environmental <laughs> as, a, as a consultant. Um, and I was invited to join Ecoflora when it start, was started by my father and my cousin. Mm. Uh, but I've been there since six months after it started and the, for my last 18 years, and it's mm. kind of my life project. Yeah. Yeah. So 18 years. Yeah. Can you tell us about some of the successes, some of the bright spots when it when it's really worked, the different projects? Yeah, well, first one was this all started because we in the family were also farmers. And at some point in time, pesticides stopped working. Mm. And we just didn't have peace of mind knowing what nasty stuff we were spraying. And uh, uh, learning that we had ourselves created a tremendous issue with resistance of pest insects. So we started looking for alternatives and it was quite awkward and <coughs> not the way that a discovery company does 10 years of R&D, lab, field trials, launch. Yeah. It was idea, <laughs> rapid prototype, down to the field right away yeah. and see what happens. <laughs> ethnobotanical research. So we found in the, this amazing knowledge that is being lost with mm. the destruction of these ecosystems, indigenous communities are also, we're losing a tremendous treasure of the knowledge of millennials. And uh, well, we tried it and it was simply amazing. Mm. Uh, and that's how it all started. Mm. Then our neighbors started asking us, hey, what are you guys doing? You're not losing our production. We are, we need this solution for <coughs> farms 
So we started the company. Yeah. And you went from that and you've gone into cleaning supplies, right? And well, uh, with the biocontrol solutions for crop protection, we are now in 12 countries or so. And that was just on Mondays you were doing that? Yeah, but it was Mondays. <laughs> what about Tuesdays? So, I was, uh, we, a German, a German consultant that was helping us someday would tell me one day, hey guys, if, if you, if you find a natural blue, that be like breakthrough, it's like mm. the holy grail. Mm. And then since I've been working with indigenous communities and Afro-Colombian people in our rainforest, one day I was in a small village and I saw this small and weird fruit and I asked an Afro-Colombian lady, hey, what's that fruit for? And she said, well, that's the fruit we use to dye our hair and the, the, the fruit that indigenous people use for body painting and for temporary tattoos. And I was pretty curious about it. And she opened that fruit for me, beautiful white flesh and the unripe fruit, and suddenly blue veins started appearing. Hmm. So we discovered the Holy Grail <laughs> in the middle of the rainforest. And it's been 10 years now. Wow. And we're about to get the FDA approval, which hmm. is a true milestone from for our country, for Latin America, makes all feel so proud of bringing a, a new solution that is going to be transformative, that is going to reach every corner of the planet, and our dream is to have it in the, in the, to have a little piece of this rainforest uh, healing many persons. This is symbolically because it truly doesn't have medicinal properties. Yeah but it does have spiritual properties mm. of every little piece of candy, of flavor, of, of water, of yogurt that's going to be colored with this. It's not only blue. Blue is yeah. a primary color, so you can do with other commodity colors, yellows and reds, the mm. entire rainbow of po color possibilities. So we have the opportunity of bringing this beautiful and amazing story of restoration, resilience, life re regeneration mm. to the entire planet mm. and making, generating awareness of the need of preserving these treasures mm. that we have, still have. Yeah. We're out of time. Oh, That's yeah. horrible. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, for the next unreasonable for, program. For the next unreasonable program, when you come back as a mentor, after you've oh, brought this to I every will. corner of the globe. <laughs> Nicholas, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.